members of council, members of the executive management, members of Senate, our inaugurant this afternoon, Professor Nimala Kopal, family and friends of Professor Kopal, academics and professional staff, students, alumni, our distinguished guests from universities and organizations within South Africa, the African continent and across the globe. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nanapogu, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Nimala Kopal. The Vice Chancellor conveys his congratulations and best wishes to Professor Nimala Kopal. The Registrar, Dr. Kathy Cleland, conveys her apologies and congratulates Professor Kopal on her promotion and thanks her for her contribution to the School of Applied Human Sciences, the college, the university, and the entire community. Inaugural lectures form part of the university's public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic schools and centers. Inaugural lectures present an opportunity for showcasing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an academic's career providing official recognition of their promotion or appointment to full professorship. These lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves and to present an overview of their own contribution to their field, to academic peers, students, and research collaborators. Inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his or her family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. It is my pleasure to now introduce the Dean and Head of the School of Applied Human Sciences, Professor Matsepo Catherine Matwane, who will now formally introduce the inaugurant Professor Nimala Gopal. Greetings, uh, Professor Mkize, and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished guests and colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, greetings to you too, our inaugurant, Professor Gopal. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Gopal to you. Professor Nimala Gopal is a professor in criminology at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban. Her aggregated 34 years of teaching and research experience between basic and higher education has been an exciting career trajectory for her. She enjoys combining her research with her teaching in criminology to subscribe to research-led teaching thus ensuring that her students receive the best she may offer. Her repertoire in excess of 50 articles of research publications conforms to the DHET accredited journal guidelines. Her aim is to publish in national and international journals, both individually and collaboratively. She strongly commits herself to lifelong learning. Recently, she registered for a Bachelor of Laws degree that she is thoroughly enjoying. Of course, research is her number one passion. Her current, research, her current niche areas in research are peace and security, and more specifically, cybersecurity. Having served as an external examiner to a variety of PhD and master's students in various South African universities, contributed to her pr perspective on the nature and quality of research undertaken in South Africa. 
In addition, her frequent invitations to review and provide constructive feedback to national and international journal articles, NRF rating applications, and PhD proposals have helped sharpen her critical and analytical research knowledge and skills. Her research passion finds favor with a large cohort of masters and PhD students whose work she passionately supervises. Her supervision profile contributes to her personal preference for transformation. She enjoys the outdoors and spending time with her grandchildren. Allow me a distinguished guest to then present to you, Professor Gopal. Over to you, Professor Gopal. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Matwane. If I can have a second while I get my slideshow running. Ladies and gentlemen, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Nana Poku, our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Nklantla Mkize, my Dean and Head of School, Professor Matsepo Matwane, the Executive Management Committee of the University of KwaZulu Natal, Council, members of Council, colleagues, students, family, and friends. It is indeed a great honor and privilege for me to share with you a presentation that has culminated in my inaugural lecture. So today I will speak to you on what I am very passionate about, namely peace and security. My title today has a long history. It has a long history and has been fueled by my own passion for the subject area. But before I get to how I arrived here, I would like to share with you my personal career roadmap. So my career started in 1970, and I know that's a long time ago, and many of you would not have even been born or even been thought of at the time. So between 1970 and 1981, I completed both my primary and secondary education or schooling. In 1982, I started off at the University of Durban Westville, which then subsequently merged in 2004 with the University of KwaZulu Natal. So between 1982 and 2003, over a long period of time, I was able to earn a few degrees which allowed me, which brought me to the space that I am at. Um, in terms of my higher education experience, it started off in 2004 at the then University of where Devon Westville, where I started up as a researcher at CREP, which was a research center for education policy. And that was in 2004. In 2005, I had this unique opportunity to lecture at the University of Fort Hay in the Eastern Cape, which was one of the most special and unique experiences I've had in my life. Um, Fort Hare was a university where the culture was selfless and very accommodating indeed. In 2006, I took up a lecturing position at UKZN. And in 2008, I was promoted to senior lecturer. It took a number of years. And then in 2017, I applied for and was 
promoted to the position of associate professor. Five years later, I became full professor at UKZN. And today I am here sharing my inaugural lecture with all of you. And I'm indeed very excited about sharing my lecture with you. So I want to quickly go down memory lane as well and speak about my interest in criminology. So 1983, the 80s, the 70s and 80s was a very interesting time in South Africa. Interesting, unsettling, destabilizing for those of us who came from, especially the black community. But I say interesting in terms of my academic career, my interest in, interest in criminology is largely situated within the discourse of liberal criminology at the time. So the majority of criminologists in the 70s and 80s in South Africa were white. Um, there were small cohorts of students, especially at historically black universities, who started showing an interest in criminology. So my journey in criminology began in 1983. I boldly embarked on my journey in criminology and I chose it as one of my majors. And so after completing my undergraduate degree, I then obtained a postgraduate diploma in, in teaching. And in 1992, after three years of part-time education with the University of um, South Africa, UNISA, I achieved my honors degree in criminology. And again, I was one of the few black students who was um, undertaking a degree in criminology. But I want to quickly reflect on the time 19, between 1983 and 1985, specifically in South Africa, when you think about being a criminologist and the time, and during that time in the country, we had great deals of insecurity. In 1985, the then um, regime had declared a state of emergency. So trying to understand criminology within the broader context of the political situation in South Africa was both demanding, perplexing, and interesting. So the journey for me in terms of criminology and my pursuit and my determination actually in pursuing criminology was in 1998 when I had completed my master's degree in criminology. I subsequently went on to do a PhD in education, but returned to criminology um, in 2005 when I took up a position in, for, at Fort Hay. So when I think about peace and security, most definitely one would ask, or I would ask the question, can there be peace? Why would we want peace? Why would we want security? What, how does, what happens or what has happened in our world for us to want peace and security? And my own understanding of what has happened and what is currently happening is the fact that in South Africa, in Africa and the global world order, we find that we find an abundance of violence. And out of this violence, we coined the terms and an understanding for both peace as well as security. So if we, when we have violence, we need some form of security. And when we have that security, the ultimate aim and the ultimate goal is for us to reach for peace. Now we know that post-World War II, we saw the establishment, the world saw the establishment of the United Nations. And the United Nations was, and arguably is still a significant political organization 
and its relevance still finds favor with us today. So one of the previous um, United Nations Deputy Secretary Generals on Peace and Security spoke about peace and security for the international system and its importance to work and for even and for a nation to work. It's important for the international system to work, but also at a micro level for nations to work. He says you have to have peace and respect for human right and rule of law, and you have to deal with it at the same time. And I think if I had to unpack that a little bit, what we are saying is that for all of us to work in harmony, for nations and for international nations to work in harmony, we must have peace. And part of that peace means respect for human rights and the rule of law. And we do know, if I bring that back home, we know that the 1995 Constitution, South Africa's Constitution between 1994 and 1995, in the Bill of Rights, Chapter 10 of the Bill of Rights, or Chapter 2 of the Bill of Rights, sorry, categorically reminds us of the right for human dignity and respect. And similarly, at an international level, our United Nations Deputy Secretaries actually remind us of this respect for human rights and respect for law, because if we don't respect law, it means that we will have chaos, discord, disharmony, and conflict. So we also heard from uh, a traditional uh, writer on peace studies, Blaney, who says that peace has always been among humanity's highest values. And I think that in every one of our cultures, in any one of our religious beliefs, peace is among our highest values. And in fact, peace is more important than all justice. There would be no need for justice if we had peace in the first instance. I want to quickly zoom in by reminding us that in order to attain peace and safety, both in the international world, but specifically in the global South, it is important and incumbent to recognize and accept the three categories that actually make up the concept of global peace, which is peace, violence, and security. I will return later to this particular concept, ladies and gentlemen, family and friends. So in terms of trying to understand and in an effort to interrogate and explain how security finds itself within the peace, violence and security discourse, I borrow from the United Nations categories or framework on securities. Now we know and we understand that the United Nations that was formed, as I earlier mentioned, post-World War II, and a year later, the United Nations Security Council. And one of the basic aims and primary aims of the Security Council was to maintain global peace and security. So the United part of the United Nations Development Plan espouses seven forms of security. The first four forms from economic to environmental security is not the focus of my uh, presentation today. However, personal, community, and political security are. So I have borrowed these terms and I will interrogate them as I borrow them from the United Nations uh, Development Plan. So when we conceptualize violence, I want to remind us all that despite the apparent ubiquitousness of violence throughout human society, violent acts should not be seen as either natural or clearly defined. Sometimes we want to argue in spaces of violence that it is a natural response. It's a natural reflexive response. 
but actually I'm arguing that it is not. And also I argue that it is not clearly defined. And later on, we will look at what the lack of clarity in terms of the definition sometimes creates for us as a society and as communities. Um, a founding author and authority in constructions of violence argues for the social construction of violence. So he says it's not natural, it's socially constructed. And he notes that violence is first and foremost a social relation between two or more living organisms. And it is not a biological quality. And I fully subscribe to his definition that it is not biological and that it is socially constructed and it is a, so it is part of a full social relationship between two or more living organisms. And this kind, this relationship, which has the potential and power to destroy us as nations, both locally, nationally, and internationally. He further argues that it is structurally, structurally shaped and ideologically framed. And we've seen that both the ideology and structure of violence has played itself out. We've seen the manifestations of these uh, forms of violence in South Africa, especially in um, in the past in South Africa. But we all we but we continue to see it playing itself out, well in South Africa, but also in the international community. So when we think about violence. I think most of us know this and understand this. We perceive it as something which we know when we see it. And as a result of this, we find that there are diverse concepts of violence among both researchers, academics, but also amongst the general public. And what has happened as a result of having our own perceptions and concept, con conceptions around violence is that it has created disciplinary boundaries and particular interests in how we understand and per understand, perceive and interpret violence in our own either personal or professional spaces. And what has happened as a result of this personal interpretation is that we have lacked conceptual clarity and disciplinarity and because of this lack of clarity and the interdisciplinary nature of how we understand and perceive violence, there's a possibility that it undermines the efforts to understand violence in its multiple dimensions and to appreciate its true costs for individuals, families, communities, and societies. And at this point, I want to remind us that, you know, at the moment, we are going through 16 days of um, activism and it's violence against uh, violence against women, children, and perhaps to extend that against any person who has violence perpetrated against him or her. And I think at the same time, we appreciate and understand that in a country, in an international community where violence manifests itself, it is extremely difficult to build, grow, sustain, and develop nations and international communities for the betterment of society and humankind. We should make all attempts to reduce or eliminate violence. And I salute South Africa for the 16 days of activism, which is violence against women and others. So if we go back as as far back as 1916, when Dewey spoke about violence, and he often defined violence in relation to the intentional use of force. And currently we continue to use a, a very similar definition of violence. And this intentional use of force is to injure or kill someone. But having said that, that is the physical form of violence. We know that violence, according to the United Nations, manifests in seven different forms, amongst them physical, psychological, and political violence. So I would 
invite you, ladies and gentlemen, family and friends, to interrogate, to start perceiving and conceptualizing violence, not just in its physical manifestation, but also in its political manifestation, as well as very importantly, its psychological manifestation. We know that psychologically, if we, if our psychology or our psychological spaces are violently invaded, it does inhibit our ability to produce and be the best that we can possibly be. So I want to also remind us of the work of Johann Galton, who in 1969 published one of the most influential examinations of forms of violence. And he interestingly challenged the narrow concept and definition of violence. So what he did then was that he defined violence as the cause of the difference between the potential and the actual, between what could have been and what is. He says that violence is that which increases the distance between the defense, the potential and the actual. And he says that violence is present when human beings are being influenced so that their actual somatic and mental realizations are below their potential realizations. So, it is, so when we think about violence, I think it's just so necessary and important to look beyond the narrow definition and conception of violence. The idea, the manifestation, what violence looks and feels like is an absolutely an extremely concept notion. So efforts that are aimed at superficial efforts aimed at reducing or eliminating violence is most likely going to fail both nationally, internationally, at the domestic level, at whatever level we want to reduce violence. Importantly, ladies and gentlemen, is for us to understand and interrogate violence as a complex phenomenon. So I want to zoom into the concept of violence in the global south. Now, all of us or some of us may already know that the Global South encompasses developing and emerging countries. And we know that the political and economic uh, existence or the economic and political infrastructures, discourses, ideas, ideologies in the Global South are often quite different from those in the Global North. Now, to bring it closer home, the Global North is usually understood as the Americas, the, the UK, countries that, have, that are so-called powerful, countries that dominate, for example, currencies, Europe. We have the Euro. And if we had to look out at our currencies or currencies in the Global South, it's a very difficult, those are very difficult currencies to compete with. So we have the global north and we have the global south. Now, whilst we whilst we understand and may recognize and may, may even want to identify with some of the practices of the global north, I want to share my own notions around the global south. Within the global south, I think we have cultures of caring, we have cultures of understanding, we have strong value systems on which we base the way in which we interact with each other. But unfortunately for the global south, and unfortunately for colonization, the global south in most instances have been robbed of natural resources. And as a consequence of that, the kind of violence that we see emerging in the global south may not necessarily be the same kind of violence that we would see in the global north. Having said that, I want to make a disclaimer. It's not as though the global north has no violence. They have all kinds of violence and more that we may not necessarily see in the global south. So why am I focusing on the global south? 
I'm focusing on the global south because I think it's a very important player and a very important actor in world politics. And what we are seeing in the global south, we we some those are some of the lessons, the way in which we uh, we attend to issues of violence, the way in which we come together, the way in which we resolve problems around violence, violence are lessons that the global north can actually learn from us. So looking at the typology of violence, which is um, universal, but I want to bring it back to the global south because this is, you know, the global south, because of its socioeconomic challenges, we tend to see this happening more often. And we know that statistics will also show us this. So we look at direct or physical violence. We have structural, economic or political violence, sociocultural or, and psycholo psychological, but also ecological violence. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is, it wouldn't be unreasonable to assume that some of these forms of violence, some of us may never have heard of. And because we've never heard of them, it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't exist. At the very basic level, when we think about personal violence, we know that we find this quite often play itself out in domestic violence and violent crimes. At the national level, we see that it plays itself out in national inequalities. Who would have ever thought, who would have ever conceived of national inequalities being perceived or being categorized as a form of violence? So when our governments are unable to provide for us equally in an egalitarian manner, we can hold them accountable for a form of violence that they are instrumentalizing. So at the global level, we will have conventional wars, nuclear wars, and human rights abuses. Now, I'm not sure how many of us even realize that human rights abuses at the global real levels or at the global level is a form of violence. If we look at structural violence, powerlessness, when, when the structure, whether it's at the micro, meso or macro level, when it renders us powerless, it's a form of violence. We find workplace uh, violence. We may not be, we may not see it in a physical form, but the fact that you could become powerless in a workspace means that it's a form of structural and or economic violence. And I could go on, but at some point, I'm sure you will, you may have a chance to uh, look at some of these forms of violence. So when we look at, at and conceptualize violence, as I've already mentioned, we have structural violence, political violence, and some of that is state terror, those of us living in South Africa and born during the 60s, 70s, and 80s would have experienced some of that uh, state terror. We have every day an interpersonal violence, symbolic violence, gender and gendered violence, and then of course, legal violence. So once again, I want to zoom into the levels of violence. At the micro level, it's at the individual level, and here we find itself we find it playing itself out in uh, through assault, whether it's common assault or assault to do grievous bodily harm, then domestic abuse and interpersonal violence. At the meso level, we find violence at the community level. We find gang violence very prevalent in some at communities in South Africa, some provinces in South Africa, namely the Western Cape, that's very synonymous with gang violence. And then we have drug trafficking, which is also a form of violence. At the macro level, we would find that the those who are instrumental in violence at the macro level is the state. And how do we see it manifest itself is in the form of poverty. 
So poverty, ladies and gentlemen, is actually a form of violence. Prejudice, discrimination is a form of violence. Inequality is a form of violence. Police brutality, form of violence, and political repression is yet another form of violence that is orchestrated or um, we see it being applied through the state or state um, bodies or bodies of the state. Now the micro, meso and macro levels of violence have a, have a thread that connects them. So if we look at violence in the global south specifically, it operates in a complex web of interconnectedness between those three levels, the micro, meso and macro levels. So these levels of balance are definitely and indeed not isolated from each other. And I think in understanding these interconnection, interconnectedness, it makes it easier for academics, for scholars, for citizens, for the state, both at the national and international levels, to effectively address violence. Because in this way, when we attempt to attack violence, at one level, without considering its interplay, in all probability, we will not get our intervention correct. So we've got to understand it at all three levels. I like what uh, Robinson et al. say. They say her history of systemic, systemic oppression and social inequality at the ma macro level can contribute to higher rates of meso-level violence within marginalized communities. And that's something that we have experienced in South Africa as well as other uh, global South countries as a consequence of not having enough economic resources. Communities that are marginalized will then experience higher forms of violence, but also could contribute to higher forms and rates of violence at both the MAC at the meso level. Similarly, the consequences of micro level violence such as trauma and insecurity can fuel the cycle of violence and contribute to the perpetuation of macro level conflicts. And I think here, ladies and gentlemen, we see the relationship between micro, meso and macro levels of violence and how important it is then to understand violence at each level so that our interventions can be effective. Earlier, I promised to return to the conceptual model of global peace, violence and, violence and security. And I did mention that in attaining peace and security in the global South, it is incumbent to recognize and accept these three categories. That is peace, violence and security. So still within the genre of peace, we find that there is negative peace and positive peace. Sharp, who has done a great deal of work on uh, positive peace, as well as Galton, who started the idea, of, who worked on the idea of uh, positive peace as far back as 1971, argued that positive peace is strongly associated with social justice and equality. And concerning the latter, which namely equality, he says it is defined in terms of resources and opportunities, which I've just mentioned as well, but also with agency and decision-making power in society. But we will notice that decision-making power and agency is also coupled with economic uh, resources and the state's ability to create an egalitarian society. So Galton emphasizes that the lack of domination and the absence of hierarchy is actually instrumental in positive peace. Sharp critiques the idea that negative and positive peace as binaries or at opposite ends of the same, he says they are binaries or opposite ends of the same continent. So he sees them as, as binaries.
I'm going to skip this uh, slide in the interest of time, and I'm moving on to structural violence once more and looking at the outcomes of structural violence. So what are some of the outcomes of structural violence, especially as they manifest themselves in the global South? We see war and state violence. We see economic inequality, poverty, and other forms of inequality, lower life expectancy for some groups over others. And this is as a consequence of structural life, uh, violence. Lower le levels of educational attainments for some groups over others, disproportionate representation in prison populations, for example, disproportionate representation of some groups to suffer from pollution. So these, ladies and gentlemen, suffering from pollution is also a form of violence and it's regarded as violence that is orchestrated or whose responsibility resides in the macro structure of a country. Natural disasters, some of our communities are more prone to natural disasters because of poor um, or lack of resources. Then we find that another outcome of structural violence is unequal distribution of power, privilege, and opportunity. Let's look at it at a very localized level, at, my, at the level of South Africa. We know that because of the historical past that we've come from, not all of us had the opportunity and privilege to access higher education. And even to this day, that the majority of students who are able to access higher education from poorer communities or disadvantaged communities are only able to do so as a consequence of the national uh, student financial aid assistance. So we also have unequal life chances. You know, sometimes we sit and wonder how is it that A is able to access and have the kind of opportunities that B is unable to have. And that is because of the unequal life chances. Perhaps previous generations in a particular family was able to earn enough resources to provide those opportunities and chances. So I want to come to the last part of my presentation, which is theorizing violence through a criminological lens, because that is where I ultimately found myself. So I borrowed from Robert K. Merton's deviance typology. And what uh, Robert K. Merton has actually advocated is that there are five adaptations to strain. And when he talks about strain, he talks about strain in any society. Um, you know, we talk about stresses and strains in a society. And when he talks about the strains in a society, and when he talks about modes of adaptation and cultural goals, he says that the five, the four types of goals, the five types of goals are conformity, innovation, ritualism, retreatism, and rebellion. Now on the right hand side, you will see that I have the concepts, the five concepts or the five modes of adaptation. When we look at con conformity, what he's actually advocating is that there are goals and there are ways in which to adapt to those goals. So in any normal or any society, in any value system of societies, of communities and of families, we advocate that if we want to achieve, if any individual wants to achieve a goal, we must do it or the individual should do it through a fair and use a, a mode that is uh, acceptable. So it's, it's, it's culturally acceptable, whether it's acceptable by the family, the community or the uh, society, both national and international. So sometimes people will innovate. So they want to, they agree with the goal, but the way in which they achieve the goal may not necessarily be the way in, may not necessarily, uh, or is not necessarily congruent 
with the, the means. For example, um, an individual decides, I want to be wealthy. I want to be rich. I want to have a great deal of resources. But I don't have a legitimate means through which I can obtain this. That person may then start dealing with trafficking in drugs, for example. And then we'd find with ritualism, the individual does not accept the goal, but accepts the, the way in which the goal can be achieved. Retreatism, they don't accept, these individuals don't accept the goals, nor do they accept the, the mode of achieving those goals. And then with rebellion, they, they recognize the goals, but they don't recognize, well, they're confused in terms of whether to get it through legitimate or through illegitimate means. And they could sometimes try both those ways to achieve it. And then going into another uh, uh, criminological theory, which borrows from a social learning basket of theories is, um, is the social learning theory. And this theory in particular explains how individuals acquire knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors through observation, imitation, and interaction with others. Now we do know that at the very basic level, we have the institution of the family. And then at the community level, we will have the institution of the school, the school as an institution. So we have the family and we will have peers at the level of the school or the community. And what social learning theory helps us to identify is that children will learn from their peer groups as well as their families. And they learn through observing and through imitating others. The social learning theory posits that people learn not only through direct experiences, but also by observing and modeling the behavior of others. So here in ladies and gentlemen, I think it is so crucial for us to understand and realize that when children are growing up, when individual, when children are growing up, whether it's in the home, whether it's in the school or in the community, the way in which adults and peers behave has an extremely significant impact on how some individuals will experience that behavior. So if it is a negative behavior, it's highly likely, highly probable that some individuals, and, I, and another disclaimer is that not all individuals will behave in the same way. Not all individuals who observe negative behavior will imbibe or will start imitating the negative in, uh, behavior. And on the other side of the continent, not all people, not all individuals who observe positive behavior will actually imitate positive behavior. But social learning underpins how young people growing up uh, identify with, imitate, and observe, imitate the behavior that they observe. And I think one classic example, an example that is quite um, widely experienced, is for example, gangsters will become musicians and youngsters then believe that they should, they idolize uh, these musicians who have come through a gangster route, who are still gangsters perhaps, or even in, you know, in communities where gang activities are quite high, we find that youngsters one think that it is a glorious life. They, they fantasize around it, they romanticize the ideas and they, then may and could join those gangs. This is learn the social learning theory, and we look at the fact that imitation, um, deviant behavior, normative behavior, etc., intersects. It's an intersection between both peer groups as well as families, and this is what we see in the intersection is what individuals could uh, imitate. And then finally, the last theory, which is the rational choice theory, and this is a theory that's very um, uh, popular amongst criminologists and criminology students. It's a theory that states that individuals use rational calculations to make rational choices 
and achieve outcomes that align with their own personal objectives. Now, this rash, the rational choice theory um, is quite narrow as well in, in the sense that it believes that all human beings are rational thinkers and make rational choices and that um, we are all rational actors, that we weigh up what we uh, do, what we see, how we interact with society, and we know that in a normal society, in everyday life, that is uh, that is quite far from the truth. So how can we resolve the issue of violence and attain peace through security? My own contention is that we must emphasize positive values, open communication, have self-verification and self-validity, take ownership in what we do, in how we behave, in how we think, in how we act. Ensure that we recognize the weaknesses in ourselves, ensure that we recognize the strengths in ourselves, recognize the weaknesses and strengths in others in order to help them grow and develop. We need to do strong ethical leadership because law, strong ethical leadership is bound to take us on a journey towards peace, safety, and security. Try as far as possible, or actually, we should follow rules and procedures. Because when we do follow rules and procedures, the chances, the opportunity for violation and conflict is reduced. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to my inaugural lecture. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I find it very easy to give a vote of thanks to Professor Nimala Gopal, as I have worked with her for, for decades at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. So it is my pleasure to take, this, to take this opportunity to thank Professor Gopal immensely for a fascinating inaugural lecture which touches on what is currently a very important topic nationally and internationally. Those of us who live in the greater Durban area, for example, will be aware that next door to us is an area known as INCP, standing for Inandantuzu, Makwamashu, and Phoenix. And this area has been cited as being amongst the top crime capitals of the world. It is a distinction that no country wants to have. Chief amongst these are heinous crimes that are directed at women, children, and those whose life preferences differ from the main, mainstream. Cyber crimes are also on the increase. Internationally, two major wars and several that are not spoken about are unfolding, and these wars will forever shape the global community. Your research and scholarship, Professor Gopal, is therefore timely as it responds directly to the challenges of our time. As you reflect in your lecture, the Ubuntu philosophy and its thematic variations in the South can contribute to global peace building. As the University of KwaZulu-Natal, we are proud to have you as a distinguished member of our community. We are grateful for the several roles that you have played at the university, be it as a lecturer or a professor, a dean's assistant, uh, assisting me in the office several years ago, an academic leader of teaching and learning, a member of the UK ZN Council for a long period of time, a unionist, an acting dean of the school, and the various roles you have played in mentoring our emerging academics, ensuring that you co-publish with them and introducing them to the art 
of writing research grants. Personally, I've also grown from the many discussions, agreements, and disagreements that we've had over the years, and of course, your consistent and principled leadership. I'm also aware that family is very close to you, and this includes your grandchildren. We are grateful to your family, and particularly your late mother, for making you the person that you are. Ladies and gentlemen, several delegates have attended today's inaugural lecture by Professor Kupal. Those delegates have come within and beyond our shores. We thank you all for celebrating Prof. Kupal's successes with us. I would like to thank the Dean and Head of the School of Applied Human Sciences, Professor Masepo Matwane, colleagues in the School of Applied Human Sciences, colleagues in the college and the university community, the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences, Correctional Services, and other government departments for providing an intellectual home to our inaugurant, uh, Professor Gopal. To the corporate relations team, ably led by uh, Ms. Noma Zondo, Ms. Pamela Adams, Ms. Sandra Ramsarup, and many others, and the registrar's team, led by Dr. Cleland, thank you for organizing yet another excellent inaugural lecture. With those words, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all, and may you go in peace. Thank you, Nyabonga, and bye-bye.